So again, what we are in the middle of a, a battle to conquer this this diagram here to, to understand the diagram where we have conformally coupled scalars exchanging a, a massive particle. And for now, the massive particle doesn't have spin. And uh, yesterday, I was trying to justify this, uh, this equation that delta u plus something like m squared over h squared. Now I'm going to be a little bit more precise. It's really something like this. There is a minus 2 here. If you do the computation carefully, times f equals uv divided by u plus v. And likewise, delta v. over u plus v, OK? So this is just a quick uh, bulk, uh, just like um, a quick bulk reasoning for why you would expect such an equation to be true, so that it doesn't look like I pulled everything out of nowhere. I was trying to justify it from this flat space uh, amplitude uh, business. But if we look, if we were to actually write down uh, this diagram using standard, you know, uh, perturbative diagrams in the bulk and doing some integral over time. So there are like two, two special points here, like at time eta and time eta prime, and you'd have some some type some type of a propagator. Of course, you need to specify the boundary conditions for this propagator and. The boundary conditions for the propagator have everything to do with the boundary conditions for those uh, equations that we're going to spell out in some detail in a second. But most importantly, the propagator satisfies some type of Klein-Gordon equation. And I'm, I'm just writing it for eta. Uh, but of course, I can also write it for eta prime. Okay, so. If you apply this Klein-Gordon operators uh, to, to the propagator, then the, the propagator collapses and you get a delta function. Okay? So the, the whole point of that equation is that if I start from, from the Klein-Gordon equation for the propagator and I get a delta function, then this whole thing becomes very much like the contact for points lambda phi to the 4 interaction that we computed yesterday. Right? Is that clear? So the, the only non-trivial step is in figuring out if you can trade time derivatives for momentum derivatives. And uh, that's where you know the facts that the eta comes around for the ride with, uh, with uh, the momenta k and the momentum s becomes important. Okay, So you can trade time derivatives for momentum derivatives. So you would start with this equation inside of the integrand, and you would pull out some momentum derivatives that effectively do the job of uh, evaluating these uh, time derivatives on the inside. Okay, So that's, if you do that carefully, you end up, if you do it for eta, you will end up with an equation like this, delta u, because recall that u is s over k1 plus k2 and v s over k3 plus k4. Okay, so what do these equations mean physically, right? So, so it means that this process, the, the solution f of this equation is correctly describing consistent time evolution of this massive particle in the bulk propagating from time eta prime to time eta, okay? And then you're integrating all over the different possible times, eta and eta prime. So the delta u equation tells you that I can act here on the left momenta, and somehow the action on this momenta effectively brings this vertex close to this one. And then if I do that, I'll end up with a contact interaction. And likewise, if I, the delta v equation tells me that I can do something similar here on the right. And if I act with some 
uh, v derivatives, I'm just moving this vertex around effectively. And if I, you know, prepare things properly, I can collapse this vertex all the way to here. So I should get again the context term. Okay. So that's the intuition for for where those equations come from. Okay. Is that clear? So, and if you if you do the things like uh, the the actual computation carefully, that well, yesterday I was just writing m over h which is asymptotically correct, but okay, if you do things carefully, there is a factor of uh, minus two here, all right? Any questions? So this is our task today, is to understand this equation and uh, describe its dynamics, and then hopefully I'm gonna explain how the story works for spinning particles. If the exchange particle has spin, how you generalize this, this story. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is, um, is the following. Uh, maybe. Okay. Maybe I'll. I'll in Let me, let me uh, make the analogy with scattering amplitudes again. So the scattering amplitude, well, there's no, t, there's no dependence on the t Mandel's thumb here. It's like g squared over s minus m squared, okay? So we're in flat space. We're describing this process in which I exchange a particle of mass m. One, two, three, four here. And now let's take low energies, okay? Low energies, which means S much less than M squared. And now we can Taylor expand this, okay? And uh, let me just uh, flip, flip a sign here to make uh, my life simpler. So if I, if I do a Taylor expansion of M, I get you know, G squared over M squared plus uh, g to the fourth over m to the fourth s plus g to the six over m to the six s squared plus ta ta ta, okay? So I, for at low energies, this exchange uh, amplitude can be written as a sum of contact terms. So what am I recovering? I'm recovering the EFT expansion. So I'm working at low energies. I don't have uh, enough resolution to see this uh, resonance. But at low energies, I see some contact terms. But the coefficients of the various contact terms are not completely arbitrary. So there is some small indication that uh, I'm really measuring interactions due to a single mediator, okay? So the fact that the various coefficients are related to each other by, you know, I'm just multiplying them by the same factor as I go higher up in, in relevance is giving me some hints of the presence of a new state of a certain mass and a certain coupling, okay? Is that clear? So here I'm working on the EFT part and the EFT expansion. So if I have very good resolution and I measure some irrelevant operators, even if I can't, you know, hit the pole, the resonance, I'm already learning something about where I expect new physics to kick in. Okay, I'm learning some features of the new particle. All right. So can we do the same thing here? Recall from yesterday. Recall from yesterday that this uh, right-hand side of the equation, so C naught uv divided by u plus v, is like the simplest context term. It's coming from some phi to the fourth here in the bulk. Okay. In, if I have uh, context terms with more irrelevant interactions with some derivatives sprinkled around the various phi's, 
then these contact terms are related to C naught by C n delta u to the n times C naught. Okay? So, just like here, I get more, irre more irrelevant contact terms by multiplying by S. Here, I must act with this operator delta u. But now, let's, uh, let's drop the minus 2 just for the sake of the argument. Okay? So now, I'm trying to solve the equation. I'm trying to solve the equation delta u plus m over h squared. equals C naught, okay? So delta U plus M over H squared equals C naught. Now your first year undergrad, your professor tell you, can you solve this equation? You said, oh, easy. C naught divided by delta U plus M over H squared. Why do you take Differential equations class, right? It's easy. That's actually morally not totally terrible. So let's uh, Taylor expand this. Let's make uh, take m to be very large. So then, what do you get? You get h over m squared c naught. Then, uh, well, unfortunately, there's some annoying minus sign. H over m to the fourth delta u. C naught plus h over m to the 6 delta u squared c naught plus ta ta ta. Okay? So, but what is delta u c naught? It's the first irrelevant contact. Well, it's the, it's the contact interaction where I sprinkle more derivatives. It's the analog of s over there. And here, the analog of s squared and so on. So this formal solution, so this is not like a real solution. It's a formal way of writing the solution. But it looks like an EFT uh, expansion of the answer. Okay? So is that clear, uh, the, uh, the analogy? Okay. So it looks like we're done. We just get a bunch of contact terms. And um, that's it. So we can go home. But we're actually missing some important physics when we do that. So this is the EFT expansion. And uh, here we're missing some physics that uh, is really tied to the fact that we're in curved space, which is the spontaneous particle production part. The fact that you are in a curved background, remember from the first lecture, one of the features of being in a curved background is that you have spontaneous particle production. Okay? Well, if you really kept the whole series here, in the case of flat space, you can just resum and write that formula over there with a pole. Here, there's still something missing. In particular, notice that this, uh, this, this EFT expansion part is analytic in H. Okay? There's H squared, H to the fourth, H to the sixth, etc. Well, spontaneous particle production is an exponentially tiny effect. It goes like, for large masses, it goes like e to the minus m over h. So I want to show you how you see that from, uh, from, so somehow that equation over there, if you're a little bit more careful in solving the equation, you, you actually do, you are forced to add this exponentially tiny correction to the solution. So you discover spontaneous particle production. Okay? So that's one feature that is just different from uh, how things work in flat space. Is that clear? Okay. So I'm going to give you a toy example of, uh, of how this works. All right. 
So particle production. So there's a limit of that equation of, uh, of that equation over there, in which it reduces uh, to something like this. So uh, if you send v to zero and you keep uh, u over v fixed and rescale f. Anyway, so there's something, there's some massaging you can do of that equation up there in which it will collapse down to something a little bit simpler, which looks like a, a, a forced harmonic oscillator. So you get some um, equation that looks like this, psi squared, d psi squared plus mu squared plus a quarter times f equals psi over 1 plus psi, okay? Where mu is morally related to m over h. And this one quarter here is just for convenience, okay? So now we want to solve this equation here. So it's just a toy example and actually does describe a solution of that equation in a certain kinematical regime. And uh, a more familiar form of this equation, perhaps, but not so convenient for calculation, is that if you change variables to psi equals e to the t, then you get uh, d dt squared plus mu squared f uh, ta -ta -ta -ta, equals 1 over 2 cosh t over 2, okay? So it's like a harmonic oscillator equation, but with a forcing term, all right? So now let's solve the equation. And we want to find a, a solution for the equation everywhere on the line. So we want to have a good, a good solution to the equation. And... Uh, Let's start by finding a solution, a formal solution to the equation around psi equals zero, okay? So around psi equals zero, then uh, one particular solution, so we just write some power series, is <laughs> F of psi equals sum minus 1 to the n psi n plus 1 half divided by n plus a half squared plus mu squared. Okay? So I'm just trying to impose a power series solution uh, to the equation and I'm just like the standard Frobenius method. And then order by order, I find a recursion relation for the coefficients. And I solve for the recursion relation, this is the solution. And modulo this annoying factor of square root of psi, it's like a standard analytic, analytic solution of the equation, okay? Also notice that it's uh, analytic in mu. Okay? It just has like a, a 1 over mu squared, 1 over mu to the fourth. If I take mu to be very large, I can write this thing as 1 over mu squared plus subleading corrections if I expand the mu squared plus n plus a half squared over mu squared, okay? And this sum is from, for all positive n, n equals 0 to infinity. Now, this sum has a radius of convergence, okay? Meaning that this is a good solution to the equation as long as psi is not uh, bigger than 1. Okay. So uh, for psi less than 1, it's a good solution and it's analytic. So let's call this f less. But I want to find a solution to the equation everywhere on the real line. 
So now we need to expand around the different points. So we go to 1 over psi, very small. We go to psi equals infinity and try to expand there. So now another particular solution. So is the following. Sum n equals 0 to infinity minus 1 to the n, psi to the minus n minus a half divided by, very similar, okay, but now 1 over psi has to be less than 1, okay. So this is a series that converges everywhere in as long as 1 over psi is less than 1. Okay? So we have a totally good solution that has nice analyticity properties in this uh, mu parameter. If I take the mass to be very large, there's some sort of EFT expansion in the sense that I can, you know, take F and write it as 1 over mu squared times something plus, actually here, if I take mu to be very large, and I'm expanding, say, around psi equals zero, I have a Taylor series expansion of this term. So I can just write one over mu squared times something, and then this operator acts on this, and you know, I can reorganize the whole sum, this argument that I was giving here, into something like this. Is that clear? Yeah. From that one, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the the the, the full equation is a, is a reduction of uh, this equation here. So with the minus two. Yeah. But yeah, the, the the I mean the the actual details of the solution are not important. The only thing I I want you to focus on is that I could run a very similar looking argument here, in the sense that I can take you know the the you put the whole thing on the right hand side. Taylor expand the source and then work at heavy mu and write something as like powers of 1 over mu acting on good uh, powers of psi, okay? So analytic in mu. So it looks like an EFT expansion, all right? But now comes the problem. So they, you can do that, but you want a good solution everywhere on the line, so you have a good solution in a certain part of the line and another good solution on a different part of the line. But now you must do matching, okay? So you, you need to have something good everywhere, some continuous solution with a, a good, uh, uh, you know, whatever you, if you decided to be, I'm kind of killing the punchline. So I want, I, we need to do matching, okay? Let's try to do matching and see what happens. Let's see if this solution and this solution are actually a good solution everywhere in the line. <laughs> so what do you have to do? You go to psi equals one. Okay. Now let's start from this. So what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to take this uh, solution, for example, you take f le less at psi equals 1, and uh, you take f greater at psi equals 1, and you, you check whether they're equal, and also whether their derivatives are equal. And lo and behold, they're not, okay? They're not equal. So it means that I can't just declare that the full solution has a nice Taylor series expansion around psi give less than one given by this formula and a nice Taylor series expansion given by this formula for psi greater than one. It just doesn't work. I won't have continuity. There will be some discontinuity at psi equals one. 
So what do I have to do to make everything work? It's a differential equation, right? So I just found a particular solution. I still have freedom. I can add homogeneous solutions to the, to the equation, right? So what are the homogeneous solutions of the equation? So, so these are not the same. So let's say I, I just really like f minus. So I just want to keep f minus. So then I must do something to f plus. Ah, sorry, sorry. Sorry, the, the, yeah, the derivative is discontinuous. Sorry. So you just care about the first division, not the higher division? Uh, because uh, we are solving that equation, and, and uh, I think that because it's a second order equation, it's guaranteed that, the, that uh, once, you, once everything is moved at zero and first order, then the equation guarantees that it's always moved. So. Okay, so, so say that we keep f minus, f minus of psi, but then for f plus of psi, I can add now homogeneous solutions. Okay. f homogeneous plus and f homogeneous minus. Okay? And what are the homogeneous solutions of the equation? The homogeneous solutions are if homogeneous plus or minus. If I didn't mess things up, they are given by this formula. Psi to the plus or minus i mu. Okay. And now if I do if I do the matching, so okay, so I I I'm I can write some c plus and then some c minus and i need to keep the the actual value of the function the same but now i have the derivatives didn't match but now i can try to tune this coefficient so that the derivatives match and i don't mess up with the fact that the function them, uh, the function itself is the same okay on the on the left and on the right in other words i want a function I want a function that will uh, look like this. F of psi will be f less of psi when psi less than 1 and f greater psi plus some stuff when psi is greater than 1. Okay? So now I invite you to do the matching and I'll, I'll just tell you what the answer is. The answer is the following. There's pi over cosh pi mu. Ah, God damn it. Okay, there is a one half here. One half plus i mu. So now you have a solution that uh, has a continuous uh, first derivative. So you have something that is analytic for a small psi, but the price you pay to have a solution that is well defined everywhere on the line is you had to add some piece proportional to the homogeneous solution. But now notice the following, there is a cost here. So when mu is very large, this homogeneous solution goes like e to the minus pi mu. Okay? While this um, EFT part goes like 1 over mu squared. Okay? So somehow the, the requirement of making the solution smooth everywhere on the line forces you to add an exponentially tiny correction to the to the equation. Okay? So this is really the source of spontaneous particle production in this language of the differential equation. Okay? So this is spontaneous 
particle production. And it's not visible in, in, uh, in this EFT form. Okay? You can't write this as some power series in 1 over mu. So this, this, you're, you're going to miss these effects. All right? Questions? Maybe it's also worth saying that it's also not analytic in layer. These are related right? Right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, if you look here, you only have like, you know, all modulo this pesky factor of a one half here. These are only positive powers of, uh, of uh, actually it's psi, sorry. It's not as, yes. <laughs> my Greek is, is a bit rusty. But um, yeah, so here you have this psi to the i mu and this psi to the minus i mu, okay? So this non-analytic pieces, are forced on you, and they are encoding some interesting physics of the fact that you're, you have some forcing. This forcing term here forces, no pun intended, to add you to add this uh, spontaneous particle production piece. Okay? Okay. Shouldn't we have uh, the side beta and the beta that equal lambda for the second Ah, but now, but now it doesn't matter which uh, which uh, uh, yeah. at, at one it doesn't matter which formula you pick, right? They were engineered such such, such that it doesn't matter. But now, for psi greater than one, this uh, term becomes important. Yeah, but it's true. Yeah, this is, uh, uh, of course, it's, uh, it depends on the actual uh, interpretation of, uh, of the solution. For the case of uh, the cosmological correlator, we're going we're gonna to figu figure out all the boundary conditions. But in, in the toy model, it depends on, on how you're interpreting this. If you're interpreting this as time and you like things to begin at rest and so on, so that would pick certain boundary conditions for you. Okay. But, uh, the boundary conditions for the cosmological problem will be a little bit different. Okay? All right. Very good. So now, so now we go back to the to the case we're interested in, which is this. Delta G. So it's a, it, it's a pair of ordinary differential equations. It's a second order uh, differential equation. So we have to impose uh, two boundary conditions on each one of the variables. Okay. And again, let's, if we look at the operator in more detail, delta u, u squared, one minus u squared d two u minus two u cubed du. So there are a couple of special points when uh, this uh, fella here goes to zero. So u goes to zero or plus or minus one. So we're going to impose boundary conditions. Uh, we need just two boundary conditions. So we're going to impose boundary conditions as u goes to plus or minus 1. Okay? So first of all, uh, this is just a recap of what I said yesterday. So when u goes to... <laughs> when u goes to plus 1, 
then S over K1 plus K2 goes to 1. So this is the folded limit. Okay, so I'm just taking K1 and K2 to be a line. So in this limit, I want the solution to be regular. Okay. No singularity. So if you write, so going back to this analogy here, if you try to write something like in a power series around a given kinematical regime, around a certain value of u, then if you write the solution and you take the, say the solution converges and contains the point u equals 1. So now if you write something analytic and you try to go to u plus 1, Generically, you find some singularity. Okay, you say say that the, the um, your series has some radius of convergence, so that when you when you send u to plus one, you're getting right at the boundary of the convergence radius. Then your power series will kind of resum into a logarithm generically. Okay, so then you you better make sure that you add so. I forgot to say, but the, but the homogeneous solutions to this equation are like uh, hypergeometric functions that behave like logarithmically close to these uh, special points. Yeah. So you do have to add some homogeneous solutions to remove this uh, folded singularity. Okay? Is that clear? So that's a little bit analogous to uh, making sure that things are uh, matching properly. So that's one boundary condition. So we need four. So it's two conditions in U and two conditions in V. So the same thing you need to do for V. As V goes to plus one, you want no folded singularity. Okay. So in uh, physically, that's kind of that's equivalent to picking a state. So what you're doing is you're picking the initial states to be the standard. Hartle-Hawking vacuum of the fluctuations. Okay. So an um, absence of folded is equivalent to picking the initial state. So people do. Uh, uh, People do discuss in the literature the idea that maybe the inflationary initial states, I don't know, they say Planck physics, blah, blah, blah. Maybe the initial state is not the standard vacuum states. And generically, if you do that, remember that we were imposing that at very early times, as eta goes to minus infinity, that uh, we would like our modes to behave like uh, e to the minus ik eta, right? But now if I relax this and I try to add some linear combination of e to the minus i k eta plus e to the plus i k eta, maybe with some relative coefficient here, this is what people refer to as a modification of the initial state. This, is, this usually spells trouble because remember that we have to do these integrals, right? Uh, if you do standard bulk perturbation theory. So you're going to have some integral over, over time. And you're going to have these mode functions. And now these mode functions are going to have some e to the minus i k eta plus c e to the plus i k eta. So you have a bunch of them. And usually perturbation theory is done in such a way that the, these exponentials, they combine in factors that get damped as I go to very early times. Okay? So there's some prescription that damps these exponentials here. Okay? But now if I have a linear combination of these uh, two exponentials, then something something's got to give, right? If I go to very early times, if I'm if I'm picking the i epsilon prescription to kill off these uh, exponentials here, then I'm in trouble because of these ones, at least in a certain kinematical regime. 
Okay? So that's why these folded singularities appear. It's not entirely clear if there is a good prescription that will give rise to these uh, solutions with folded singularities. But that's the way that people usually interpret um, these, these uh, shapes of non-Gaussianity with folded singularities. Okay? So of course you have to cut off the, so there's a lot of uh, uh, magic that you have to do to get something sensible looking. So you have to cut off the, the time integral Okay, and then you you're, maybe you're not gonna have something that has a real singularity. It gets smoothed out a little bit, but then you break the Sitter symmetry. So it's highly dependent on the early time cutoff. This type of of uh, non-Gaussianities. Of course, if it's true, it's wonderful because you look up in the sky, you align your momenta, and then boom, you see like a big amount of non-Gaussianity, which we don't. Okay, so it's very, you can put constraints very quickly on these uh, types of signals, so yeah. I guess people like it because you can put constraints, but it's coming from these uh, uh, kind of funny, funny choice of mode functions, okay? All right, so we don't like this. So we cross this out. So that's, uh, that gives us, Question? That gives us two boundary conditions. Now we have to specify two more. And they are related to sending u and v to minus 1. u and v to minus 1. So when we do that, uh, what we're doing is taking either this to zero or this combination of energies to zero, okay? And as I was showing to you yesterday, uh, especially when we were discussing contact interactions, when we send the sum of energies to zero, we're probing the flat space limit or dragging certain interaction vertex to very early times. Okay. So if we take this limit, for example, then we have one, two, three, four. Then effectively what we're doing is we're sending this left vertex all the way to minus infinity. Okay, so that's u going to minus one. I want to do the same thing for this guy here. We send effectively v to minus one. Okay. And uh, the answer you get is a little bit interesting. Mm, do I want to explain it? Yeah, maybe I'll cheat a little bit, okay? So the answer is a little bit interesting. What you get and, uh, is the following. So if we set u to minus 1, I need to get a left scattering amplitude, m left. So f as u, the exchange solution as u goes to minus 1 with v fixed, needs to go to the left sca uh, scattering amplitude, m left, which uh, remember that the scattering amplitude of uh, three scalars is just a constant. Okay, So it's just a constant here. And then times, and I'm sweeping stuff under the rug by putting times with a, a little ball here, okay? So it's times in a moral sense. So it's times the three-point correlator. So now here on the right, I have the three-point correlation function of the, of the intermediate scalar, sigma, intermediate, sigma s, times the scalar three, times the scalar 4, okay? So I get some sort of centaur. It's like a hybrid of uh, two different beasts. So I have a flat space object, the, the scattering amplitude, and here I get a three-point correlation function in, in, uh, in curved space, okay? In particular, if I send both u and v to minus 1, Ah, sorry, I forgot to, I forgot to say, of course, it, it, it goes singular when I do that. Remember that the flat space, uh, the flat space uh, uh, limit of uh, contact interaction is a pole 
right? It's a pole. So for, but now because we have an exchange diagram, the, the singularity is a little bit milder. So just like here, I would have to remove some folded logarithmic singularity. Here, I'm going to have some logarithmic singularity also. So I'm going to have this times log of 1 plus u. Okay. So instead of being a pole, it's a little bit milder than that. It's logarithmic. And in particular, if I send both u and v to minus 1, at the same time, then I'm really going to get the left scattering amplitude times the right scattering amplitude times log 1 plus u log 1 plus v. Okay? And these scattering amplitudes are numbers. Okay? So they're just g, like a, you know, g and g. And these numbers are the same numbers that are appearing here. Remember that when we have the scattering amplitude, I have a three-point vertex on the left, a three-point vertex on the right. So in flat space, it's like g squared over s minus m squared, which is really like, you know, m left, m right. Okay? So if I put a 1 here, this number here is not arbitrary. That's, uh, is that clear? So I, I, I need to fix um, the limits. So I don't remove a singularity. The singularity should be there. But uh, the normalization of the singularity is fixed. So if, in the same way that if there is a g here and a g here, the, the four-point scattering amplitude must have a g squared. Here I have a double singularity in u and v related to sending both of these vertices to minus infinity separately. But then the residue at the singularity is the product of scattering amplitudes that appears here. Okay? So the one that appears here is related to a one times a one appearing here. All right? So it's not like this number can be a hundred and this number is arbitrary. That's, uh, that's the point. So now that's it. I have four boundary conditions. I have two ODEs. I can solve it. That's it. I just go to any kinematical regime. I find a, a power series expansion that converges around the kinematical regime that I'm interested in. If, uh, if the radius of convergence contains these uh, special points, I go there to those points and make sure that I'm adding the homogeneous solutions to, en to enforce my boundary conditions. Then I find a solution everywhere on the UV plane. I just do gluing. Okay? And that will, define, that will define the solution to these equations. Okay? So it's kind of like a generalization of a special function. It's like a Bessel function solves a, a differential equation with some specific boundary conditions. Depending on the boundary condition, you call a Hunkel function, Bessel function, and so on. So this is the cosmological four-point function. Actually, <laughs> we thought it didn't exist, but it turns out some uh, French uh, person uh, discovered this uh, the solution to an equation like this. So it's called, I don't know, I'll, I'll, yeah, anyway, I'm not going to give credits to the, <laughs> to the guy that discovered it. But um, anyway, uh, so we thought it was a special function, but uh, not quite. Let's say no, <laughs> for our credits. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so, so that's it. And now I'll show you a plot of uh, how the solution looks like. And we're going to extract the physics out of the... <laughs> so I, I want to contrast so the solution. I want to contrast the, the solution for the four-point function versus the four-point scattering amplitude. So I'm going to write the four-point function here on the, on the left as a function of the shape of my quadrilateral, k1, k2, k3, k4, versus the flat space 
scattering amplitude. Here is the scattering amplitude. One, two, three, four. Okay. So in the case of the scattering amplitude, what we dial is the center of mass energy. And we measure some cross section. While here we dial the shape or or yeah, I guess we call momentum ratio, but it's um, yeah, it's like the shape of the quadrilateral versus the size of the four point function. Okay. So now here color would be great. So let's see. And, all right. So let's do scattering amplitudes because we're we're used to more used to them. So we start at low energies with uh, this uh, power series. There's some EFT expansion, and then I have to fit some Taylor series coefficients. So I have some EFT-like expansion, like S plus S squared plus a constant and so on is a good fit to the scattering amplitude that gives me this cross section. And then when I hit the pole, the resonance, then the scattering amplitude shoots up and the location of the pole tells me about the resonance, okay, m squared. So here is like the particle production part. And now, when I'm off the resonance, I incorporate these new states into my effective field theory, and then off I go. I continue fitting things with, uh, with effective field theory. Okay. Now here, uh, what is the analog? I'm going to start with the equilateral shape. Okay. So when all sizes are equal, there's no hierarchy between the various sizes. So I start from a square. Yeah, I don't know what it means to grow the shape. So the, just uh, bear with me, okay? So the, I start with the square, and I go as I go to the left, the square is being squashed into something like this, okay? So just uh, think of, uh, of this axis as the ratio between the size of the diagonal and the typical size of the edges of the quadrilateral. So when there's no hierarchy between the various sizes, then I have, again, equilateral non-Gaussianity. Remember that all momenta are leaving the horizon at roughly the same time. So I can fit very well the four-point function as a sum of contacts-like interactions. Okay? So I start with um, some contacts-like interactions. So this is like effective field theory. And now, as I squeeze, remember that, let's go to the space-time diagram. As I squeeze, I'm essentially, if, if this is momentum, if I'm squeezing like one, two, three, four, if I'm making this momentum here very soft, then the intermediator particle needs to travel many, many Hubble volumes, okay? One, two, three, four. So if it travels many Hubble volumes, it still mediates an interaction. So even though naively effective field theory would, um, would shut down at a certain rate, then yeah, this picture is terrible, sorry. Uh, the curves are just wrong, OK? So the, the, but uh, just uh, it's a cartoon, OK? So the, Let's say that it shuts off like this. But now that I have an inter intermediator particle, the signal doesn't, doesn't die off very fast. But recall that this is a massive particle, so it can't mediate interactions with arbitrarily large strands. 
the power of this massive particle gets redshifted away. And also, at late times, it goes like e to the imt. So as I'm squeezing more and more, it has to travel many Hubble radii. So it starts picking up a phase. Okay. So what, what's going to happen? So I'm going to get more power, but actually the particle starts picking up a phase. Okay. So not only I see that there is more signal than I would expect from contact terms, coming from the spontaneous particle production parts. I also see, you know, that the, the particle is traveling over time, many Hubble radii. Okay? So this is really time evolution that you're seeing in this spatial pattern in the sky, which I think is pretty fantastic. Right? You're just changing shapes of uh, your uh, quadrilateral in the sky, and you're really seeing this hologram of time evolution of these uh, massive states. Okay. And in practice, if you remember what I drew uh, one or two days ago of the two point of the mode function of the scalar field in the sitter, this is really a proxy of the mode function of the scalar field because as I draw these points farther and farther away, effectively I'm just measuring, they are like measuring their probes, they're probing the two point function of this scalar field, okay? So these wiggles are exactly the same wiggles that appear in the two-point function of a massive scalar. So if the scalar is a little bit lighter, just like uh, uh, I drew yesterday, if the scalar is lighter, then uh, the power, it still shuts off, but the power is, there's more power at longer distance scales, okay? So, just like here, you, you discover a new particle and you re incorporate it maybe into your EFT. As I go to these uh, collapsed limits, I should start to see a bunch of power laws. And each power law is related to a new state. So I must capture these states, incorporate into my EFT expansion. So the dream is you look up in the sky and you, you see some contacts-like interactions. And as you squeeze the, the shape of the quadrilateral, you start to see all of these different fall-off decays of the four-point function. And then every fall-off decay is related to a new state that is, intermediate, that, uh, that is responsible for, for this exchange interaction. Okay? So these are for lighter particles of M less than Hubble, and this is for M greater than Hubble. All right? So the bad news is that in particle physics, the cross-section goes bazooka, right? So you see like a big cross-section, easy. Well, here, uh, unfortunately, the signal is the strongest, whereas the most boring. So here the signal is very large when it's like a, like a boring trend, like EFT-like. Unfortunately, it also becomes degenerates with late universe evolution. And then here, uh, here is where in principle, it's, the signal is the cleanest, but the signal is dying off. So yeah, there's no free lunch. It's just, uh, just the way it is. Okay? So you have to somehow hope that we see the EFT parts, and then we'll have a very good template for how it should be glued to a specific state, and you try to hunt for these tiny signals in this uh, collapsed limit. All right? Any questions? So this is how you do collider physics in cosmology. All right. Right. So stuck at low energies forever. We get to control the initial state by building a different collider. So that's how we can make the signal big. In cosmology, we don't get to control the initial state, but everything happens because this is time dependent initial condition. So even right. though we're stuck today, we don't get to build the collider. The signal is smaller, but we get to, in principle, see it. Whereas we don't even, in principle, get to see it at a, at a collider. That's just global line. Right. 
and it's humongous energies, but tiny luminosity. So <laughs> it's uh, all right. So I'm going to switch to spin now. Uh, any questions uh, regarding this? So this is just a plot of uh, the solution. So it, again, if I were just one last time, if I were to naively solve the differential equation by inverting the operator, I would just get this EFT-like trend. But the homogeneous solutions that are enforcing all these boundary conditions are precisely the ones that generate this uh, oscillatory pattern. Okay? So the right boundary conditions will force me to add these, uh, these uh, particle production parts. So now I want to switch to a different story. Well, not entirely different, but it's a little bit more technical. How does the story work once you have a particle with spin? OK, spin. One, two, three, four, particle of mass m. Now the spin s is non zero. Okay? So recall that, recall from 10 seconds ago that one, two, three, four here, if I'm exchanging a scalar particle, this is a function of u and v times one over s, right? There's a delta function of momentum conservation. But it really is just a function of uh, a non-trivial function of two variables. And one you know, bulk way of seeing why it only depends on these two variables is because, remember, I, I was writing the, the cubic vertex is like some uh, phi squared sigma, if sigma is a particle here. And then when I multiply two mode functions, I get e to the i k1 plus k2 times eta, times the propagator of the internal particle. So you see, one nice thing about working with scalars and conformally coupled scalars for that matter, is that k1 and k2 always appear in this combination, k1 plus k2. Okay. So that's why it's convenient to go to these variables u and v. Now, for spin, I'll show you in a second that uh, life is a little bit more complicated. But uh, it's not, we're not screwed. Fortunately, the Sitter symmetry is going to pin down the full answer for us. And here, the Sitter symmetry is crucial to get the whole answer. So again, let's go to flat space scattering amplitudes and see how the story works if the exchange particle has spin. So here, for the scattering amplitude of a scale, of scalar is exchanging a scalar of mass m. Locality, you know, propagators go like 1 over p squared. So that's the only thing I can, I can get at weak coupling. And then when I'm sitting on the pole, the, the amplitude factorizes, and I get the g times g. Okay? So now if I have a spinning particle being exchanged, So the beginning of the story doesn't change, s minus m squared. But now I need to write the three-point scattering amplitude on the left and on the right. OK? So how does the three-point scattering amplitude between two scalars and a spinning particle look like? Now I have a little bit more data to play with. So for the case of scalars, I showed you that there is no Mandel's thumb invariance because the momenta, uh, I can only take dot products of momenta. But now I have one more piece of data. So I have, let's take one, two, and three. So now I have epsilon. Let's start with one index, just a vector. So now I have epsilon mu of P3 and P3 mu, epsilon mu, P3. 
okay, to eliminate the negative probability part of the state. So what can I write now? Can I write something that has momentum dependence? Hmm? Yes, I can write p1 dot epsilon 3. Can I write anything else? Oh, there's three momenta, p3 dot epsilon 3 is 0. So what, what else can I write down? P2, yeah, but P2, but P2 dot, exactly. So you, you have two possibilities, but because of momentum conservation, they are related to each other, right? So P2 is minus P1 minus P3, and P3 dot epsilon 3 is zero, right? So it's really like, it's really equivalent to P1 dot epsilon 3. So it's more convenient to change basis from P1 plus P1 and P2 to P1 plus P2, P1 minus P2. So one way to... to write it is, is like this, okay? So this will be the scattering amplitude. How does the story generalize to higher spin? So if we have now one, two, three, mu one, same story, right? So now I have P1 minus P2, mu one, okay? So that's the only thing I can write down. The scattering amplitude is unique. But now it has some interesting non-trivial uh, dependence. So now here, I'll get something like this. I'll get, let's do it for spin one so I can be a little bit more explicit. One minus P2 dot epsilon three, epsilon three dot p3 minus p4 and I need to sum over the different polarizations of the exchange particle okay so because of angular momentum conservation this intermediate particle will have different polarizations I need to sum over the polarizations okay but summing over polarizations you know this this thing provides a basis in these uh, polarization vectors, they provide a basis in the space orthogonal to the momentum. Well, here it's not three, sorry. It's uh, the intermediates. Let me write intermediates. P intermediate. Okay. But the sum, this is a projector, right? Sum over the, polariza of, over the polarizations mu it's a projector onto the space that is orthogonal to the momentum p intermediate right so if you normalize the polarization vectors well up to normalization it's something like this it's delta mu nu minus pi nu pi nu over pi squared agree It has to be orthog if I dot it with P on the left or P on the right, it has to give me zero. It's, uh, it doesn't care. It's not picking any particular direction in the plane orthogonal to P. So that's what it has to be. Okay. So now if I dot these things here and uh, I rewrite I rewrite everything in terms of Mandel's terms, I will get some function of more kinematic data. So the final answer, so that's, the, that's it, that's the scattering amplitude. So the full scattering amplitude 
now as a function of S and T of the Mandelstam's is, and if I, you know, cross all the T's dot all the S's, then I'll get something that looks like this. I'm sure I'm getting it wrong, but it's, uh, I think it's M squared minus 4M squared to the, ah, to the, mm. This is always an annoying clash of notation. So this is spin S, and uh, let's do some stylish S here. So there's an S here. There's a Legendre polynomial that comes from these projectors dotted onto the piece. And of the Legendre is going to be given by this to T over uh, m squared minus 4m squared. where m are the masses of the external particles. Particle P1 squared equals m squared, divided by S minus big M squared, okay? I think it's correct, yeah. So this is the answer with uh, some G squared up front here. So, okay, the only uh, in important novelty is that, so this factor is here just so that the whole expression makes sense even for massless particles, okay? So when the mass goes to zero, the Legendre polynomial naively blows up, but uh, this also goes to zero. So that for massless particles, uh, the scattering amplitude is a function of S and T becomes uh, g squared t to the s divided by s, okay, for m going to zero. Uh, okay. Yes? Capital T is the second Mandel's thumb, right? So. For, for flat space scattering, you can write P1 plus P2 squared. That's Mandelstam number, Mandelstam number one. And now you have P1 plus P3 squared. It's Mandelstam number two. And the other one is a function of these ones. Yeah. So now, uh, even though we're working on the S channel, there's going to be some uh, dependence on the, on the second Mandelstam. Okay, so, it, so how do you, the, the, the point is how do you measure spin once you hit a resonance? So you tune the energy of your collider, you hit a resonance, and now you can dial like the impact parameter between the beams. Or you dial the, in the center of mass frame, you can look at different angles of the scattering of the outer products of the collision, and you'll see some Legendre polynomial-like behavior. And the Legendre polynomial will, so this is related to cosine of the angle. If I boost to the center of mass frame, I have one, two, three, four. So this argument here is related to cosine theta. Okay. So if I just look at different angles close to the pole, I will see some Legendre polynomial-like behavior. And the order of the Legendre measures the spin of the particle. So now we're done with spectroscopy. So we can measure the mass and the spin. So now we want to learn how to do the same story uh, in the case of the cosmological correlator. So one annoying thing about, is that clear? So this is, this is a nice story in flat space. And now there's a slightly annoyance of uh, the fact that we are in cosmology, which is the boost symmetry is not manifest in these uh, momentum variables. So it's not so easy to boost to the center of mass frame. So I'm going to give you some intuition for an ansatz, and then I'm going to tell you the answer for how the four-point function works for a spinning particle. OK. Maybe I keep that there. So for a spinning particle now, you still have one, two, 
three, four. Now I'm exchanging some guy with spin here, M and S. So what's going to happen now? So you see, uh, there's going to be a new variables that, so for scalars, this only dependent on U and V. So there has to be some new variable that plays a role analogous to what T is playing a role of here. So here, you know, if I go, if I look at the, at the amplitude in the S channel, I'm going to have a power of T to the spin of the particle, okay? So it's an, it, it doesn't have a singularity in T, but it gives me like some analytic behavior and the highest power of T that I get is related to the spin of the particle that's being exchanged. So we want to see what's the analog of these uh, stories here. So now, say I have some interaction vertex, okay? So now I have, you know, phi 1, phi 2, sigma for a scalar interaction. But now if I, if I go to a spinning particle, I need... I, yeah. Ah, no, no, yeah, M, uh, you've put uh, your favorite mask, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah there's M squared to some dimension. Okay, so, so now if I have a, a spinning particle, let's, uh, let's do spin one just for simplicity. There is a catch, of course, of spin one, but okay. I have to write, sorry, I have to write, uh, yeah, let's do spin one. I'll write something like this, phi two, d mu phi one, times sigma mu, okay? So this is an example of a cubic interaction involving a spin one particle. Okay? So now sigma mu, is gonna is gonna have a, a, a part of it that is that is proportional to a polarization vector, some epsilon i, that depends on the momentum of the particle mu. So the momentum of the particle mu is what we've been calling s. Okay. So that's uh, one part of the one part of the story, and also sigma mu will contain a bit that is related to its zero components that if we're doing uh, physics with positive probabilities, like good, good physics, then this part better just be a constraint. But it will play a role in the story. So there will be some parts of the answer that is somehow taking into account that this uh, spinning field must satisfy some constraints to propagate properly in space-time. Okay? But let's for now focus on the transverse part of the, of the vector particle. Okay. So now S vector dotted onto epsilon vector is zero. But I'll, I'll have some interaction like this. So if I, if I write something more symmetric like a current, let's say I give this some charge, so then I have something like phi one bar d mu phi 2 dotted onto sigma mu, then, you know, it's more or less inevitable that I'm going to get something that looks like this, right? I'm going to get k1 minus k2 dotted onto epsilon of s on the left vertex here, right? And likewise, lambda epsilon minus lambda, very much like a what I erased in, in uh, flat space. I'll have some epsilon minus of S now dotted, well, maybe I put indices here, ep, I, I, J times K3 minus K4, J. Is that clear? So this is just coming from, from the fact that you have to soak up the indices. You need to write something in which uh, the vectors and locality tells me that you know what happens on the left it can only depend on the momenta one and two what happens on the right can only depend on the momenta three and four 
So this is, morally speaking, kind of the only thing that I can write down. Okay? And now if I go through the same story, if I sum over lambdas, this is a projector. So I get some delta ij minus sisj and so on. So this will immediately introduce new variables that were not present here. Okay. In particular, it introduces a variable that will play the role of the Mandelstam t variable. Okay. So the, if we expand that uh, product over there, I'm going to get something that looks like K1 minus K2 dotted onto K3 minus K4 minus over S squared. Maybe you get a plus here. I'll get K1 squared minus K2 squared, K3 squared minus K4 squared. So how does this work? The delta function will make me contract the, the vectors, this vector on the left, this vector on the right, and then the, the parts proportional to si, sj. Si is k1i plus k2i, so I get the difference of the squares. And likewise here, I get sj contracted with this, but sj is minus k3j minus k4j, so that's why there's a relative plus sign here. Is that clear? But, okay, let's drop this for now and just look. So this is a new variable, new kinematical variable that, yeah, I think notation-wise it is not maybe the most brilliant choice, but in analogy with T, I'm going to call it tau. Okay. So because there's a spinning particle, or spin one, I'm going to generate a tau coming from this interaction. So what does it mean? It means that it suggests the following ansatz for one, two, three, four. Now if spin particles, spin one. So I should get, again, like a one over S that's just determined by, by the conformal dimensions of the scalars. Then I should get something proportional to tau times some function, F1, for being naive of U and V, or something like that. Here you see that this is, this is a little bit too naive, but okay, I'm, I'm being, it's a cartoon, okay? Tau, F1, tau to the 1, plus tau to the 0, F0. Okay? So the fact that there's a single power of tau is related to the fact that I'm exchanging a spin 1 particle. Okay? So... And again, the, the fact that there's a tau to the zero part is related to the fact that I, you know, conform, uh, conformal symmetry, sorry, you're saying? Oh, okay. So conformal symmetry, the Sierra isometries, will force my spinning particle to propagate in a, in a reliable way. So they drive safe. Okay, so there's no zero components generating negative probabilities. So somehow the Decida isometries know all about this. So if I want my representation to propagate properly, I impose all the Decida isometries, and they will force me to add some longitudinal parts. So naively you could say, oh, I just care about the transverse parts. But if I just write the transverse part, I break the Decida isometries. So I can, I'll, if I try to solve things, so see that tau is, a, is an isolated variable. So if I try to solve the constraint equations coming from special conformal symmetry and try to just kill off this term, I'll be forced to add something that doesn't have tau. Okay? And what this is doing is it's solving for you automatically the parts related to the longitudinal or the zero components of the vector. Okay? So that's it. So there is some ansatz that looks like, morally speaking, like this. In detail, of course, uh, life is more complicated, but morally speaking, looks like this. You feed it into the special conformal constraints, and you solve it. Okay? And then comes a beautiful fact that all you need to do is you take the scalar solution, and you apply 
some differential operator that will depend on tau and derivatives of u and v. If you apply this operator to the scalar solution, you're done. Don't need to do anything else. Wonderful. Okay. Just like here, here in the case of scattering amplitudes, it's so trivial that you're not impressed. I could just say that to spin up the scattering amplitude, I take the, the scalar scattering amplitude and I multiply by the Legendre. Okay. So here, there will be an operator. It's not just a multiplicative operator. It's a differential operator that I, I, I'll have some operator, O1, acting on the scalar solution, f of u and v. That will give me the answer for spin one particle. Okay? And the story works for any spin. You can repeat this exercise for any spin, and there is a systematic procedure to produce the solutions for any spin. Okay? So now I'll write down, now that I told you the fairy tale, I'll write down how it works in real life. So here's how it works. So for spin one, here's the solution. F is going to be one over S times some pi one that depends on tau, okay, times uv squared du dv plus some pi naught which is some function of the momenta that doesn't have tau, it's tau to the zero, times delta u acting on f, u and v. Okay? So this pi one and pi naught are functions of tau and of the absolute values of the momenta. The fact that it's not just tau is related to this term here. Okay? So th actually this is pi one. Pi one is this. But okay, the formula is not going to rock your world. So just uh, the, the only thing you need to remember is that it has a single power of tau. And this has a zero power of tau. And then there are these operators, and in particular, our good old friend, delta u, that acts, acts on the f of u and v, where f of u and v is the scalar solution. So for any mass that you feed in here, any conformal dimension that you feed in here, you will get the spinning solution for the similar conformal dimension. Okay? Great. Spin two. And from, maybe from spin two you can guess how, you can almost guess. I think you need to go to spin four to, to guess how things work in general. So you get some pi 2 of tau. It's going to contain a tau squared part. You're going to get this thing twice. Let me call this duv. Duv squared plus some pi 1 of tau uh, times duv delta u minus 2 plus some pi 0 tau delta u, delta u minus 2, acting on the same function. OK? So that's it. So you get some, some polynomial looking thing in tau and some operators acting on f of u and v. Okay. So now let's, uh, let's play with these formulas for a little bit. When does the class? Uh... Whenever you are done. Ah, but then that's, uh, <laughs> that's too loose <laughs> requirements. OK, I'll show you one example, and then uh, maybe uh, two examples. And then uh, we go have lunch. I, I want to show this looks kind of arbitrary, but I'll show you that actually there is something cool going on here that you don't need to understand where these formulas came from to interpret. 
Let's study uh, example at spin one, photon exchange. So it turns out that the photon, the photon has conformal dimension two, okay, or one. So the photon redshifts away, unlike a massless scalar. Even though it's a massless particle, yeah, by the way, why? Why does the photon redshift away in, in the sitter? So first of all, that's a, a little bit of an annoyance because we do see primordial magnetic fields in the sky and inflation doesn't give them to you for free from this uh, particle production mechanism. Why? What's the property of this action here, F squared? It's conformal. So photons in the sitter and photons in flat space, the photons don't care. Okay. So in particular, the power is redshift away. It's more like a conformally coupled scalar. So that's why it's delta equals two. So for photon exchange, the exchange solution satisfies this equation here, delta U F equals uv divided by u plus v, okay? And now if you plug it uh, on that formula over there, you get the following answer. F for photon equals 1 over s. And if you do things carefully, believe me, this is the answer. You get u plus v, u plus 1, v plus 1 plus pi 0. Well, this part you don't need to believe me. What's the pi 0 part? It's delta u acting on the exchange solution, but the exchange solution for delta equals 2. Remember that, yeah, this, so the exchange solution satisfies this equation, so I'm just going to get u divided by u plus v. So this is pretty interesting. Why? The helicity zero part doesn't have any propagating poles. Remember that this u plus 1 and v plus 1 are related to left and right propagation. You can pull a vertex on the left and a vertex on the right separately. But the photon doesn't have this at helicity zero. Right? Why? Because it only has transverse degrees of freedom. All the helicity zero part is doing is it's solving for you the Gauss's law. Okay, so you put some fluctuations, you have a photon around, you have to solve the Gauss's law, so that's the only thing that this uh, fellow here is doing for you, but there is no true propagating longitudinal parts. Okay, but here at helicity 2, you see not just the flat space limits, but you also see the propagating poles. Okay. Another cute thing is, say you were um, skeptical, and you wanted to separate. You, if you try to break up these poles, you say, I'll, I'll do partial fraction. I'll do partial fraction. It separates into a flat space uh, stuff and some, something proportional to separate three-point functions. So it's completely disconnected. If you do that, I welcome you to try. You can use the common uh, parts in Mathematica, and you'll get folded singularities. So that's the price you pay. You, you do introduce folded singularities if you want to keep these poles all separate from each other. Okay. Similar story for graviton exchange. But now for the graviton, for spin two, there are two interesting examples, actually, graviton exchange. It will solve this equation. Now it's more like a massless, a massless field because it has conformal dimension 3 or 0. Okay. So delta u minus 2f equals uv divided by u plus v. So you see. Now, we don't even need to write the answer, but if you look at this equation here, this is the equation for massless scalar exchange. But now look at the ansatz here. Delta u minus 2 
is appearing here precisely at the helicity 1 and the helicity 0 part of the answer. So if the exchange solution solves this equation, so a helicity 1 and helicity 0, you're not going to get any propagating poles, which is the right answer, right? The graviton doesn't propagate helicity 1 and longitudinal parts. It will only have propagating poles coming from the top helicity part. But this is solving the Hamiltonian and the momentum constraints of GR. So that's why these two guys come along for the ride. Okay, is that clear? So the U plus 1 and V plus 1 poles will only appear from, from this uh, guy here. And now, to really finish, I just can't resist. There is one last example. So you, let's, let's uh, look at, I'll give it a name in a second. Let's look at the, the case in which delta U F equals U V divided by U plus V. So it's a spin 2 particle of conformal dimension delta equals 2. Okay? So now if you repeat the, if you repeat the game, now, you know, delta U minus 2 is just proportional to the exchange solution itself. So at helicity 1, there will be propagating poles. So this looks like a massive, a massive uh, spin 2 state. It propagates lower helicity modes. But notice something interesting. The helicity 0 part has a delta u. It's delta u times delta u minus 2. So it will kill off the propagating poles if I feed this solution. So it means that there is a state, there is a representation of the De Sitter group that somehow propagates a helicity 2 and a helicity 1 mode and doesn't have a longitudinal part. So this does not exist in flat space. In flat space, you either propagate 2s plus 1 degrees of freedom or 2 degrees of freedom. Massive, massless. Here in the sitter, there is massive kind of light and massless. Okay. So these are, you can imagine, uh, physicists are very creative. They are called partially massless fields. So this is the partially massless graviton. It propagates four degrees of freedom. In fact, if you study the representation theory of a spin two degree of freedom and you plot here m over h squared, so the graviton is an isolated point. And then there is this point here at m over h squared x equals 2. And then you have the continuum where you propagate 5 degrees of freedom. So there's a 5 degrees of freedom part. Then this, at this point here, you lose the longitudinal degree of freedom. And actually, this is a forbidden region which is very strange. It's a feature of the sitter space. So this is usually referred to as the Higuchi bound. If you have a mass in, within this range, you're going to propagate some degree of freedom with wrong sign kinetic term. And then when you hit m squared equals 0, then again, you have good propagating a good propagating particle with two degrees of freedom. And so here's the graviton. So, some, so this formula knows about this through the appearance of these uh, delta u's and delta u minus twos. Okay. So these are very uh, strange particles. We don't really know if they can interact consistently. So, but we can still write the scalar four-point function when these uh, particles are around. They have very interesting, bizarre phenomenology. So that was the last example. And uh, OK, I guess tomorrow we'll continue. So I, I think that with this, we're pretty much exhausted with um, exchange of spinning particles for conformally coupled scalars. And now the last step is to raise this to the inflationary calculation, where we care about massless scalars and also the three-point functions. So we're going to do that next time. Thanks.